Right. Hello and welcome to the Kuhai Business Operations Series, Communication and Marketing Strategies in an Evolving Market. We're really excited to have you today. Before we get started with our lovely panelists that have joined us in our conversation roundtable, there are just a few things from the Business Operations Committee that we wanted to go over. So I'm going to turn this over to Dwayne to get us started. Hi, all. As Caitlin mentioned, welcome. Um, along with Caitlin, David, and Joel, uh, welcome from the Business Operations Planning Committee. Uh, we're glad you're you're here with us today. A few notes before we get started for today's session. Uh, we wanted to highlight the conference itself. So if you weren't planning or if you were still thinking about it, or maybe you're one of the few that have already registered, um, we, we still wanted to, to plug the conference. So save the date. The 2022 Business Operations Conference will be in New Orleans. Uh, September 19th through 22nd, so a tad bit earlier than past years. Um, as you can see on the right side, you can register today. Early bird actually closes tomorrow, um, and then regular registration closes on August 10th, and then we'll have rolling registration up into September. All the updated dates and information is on the website. Also wanted to highlight, if you still wanna get involved with us, we have a few opportunities um, for yourselves and or anyone on your teams, if you'd wanna nominate or recommend anyone. So on a rolling basis, you can join a committee. Um, so our committees are highlighted on the left. So connections, local arrangements, programming and marketing awards. Uh, a few notes for our committees. Uh, conference attendance is encouraged, but it's optional. Um, for our conference chairs, we, we like everyone to be in person, but because of the, the pandemic and getting back to in person, we definitely want folks to still stay involved. So of course we will encourage conference attendance, but um, we also welcome it if you're unable to attend due to cost or anything like that. Um, I'll mention marketing awards in a bit, or um, I'll have my colleague David touch on it, um, but also wanted to highlight that if you are attending the conference, um, program proposals are proposals are currently open. So from anything business ops, from assignments, basic needs, marketing, in terms of today's session, um, we would love to have you submit a proposal. Also to note when we when we mention that, it's not necessarily a standard PowerPoint session. That is welcome if that's the route you want to go. But you also can uh, submit a proposal for a roundtable, a panel, um, a short uh, quick take, so a 20 minute session. All the updated information is on our website, so we definitely encourage you to check it out. Submissions will be accepted on a rolling basis for the remainder of the month. Um, and then if you have any questions, um, my email is up top and I can connect you with our programming co-chairs um, for more information. David, uh, the next few slides are about marketing awards. So did you wanna mention the judges and then I'll turn it over to you for the next slide. Sure, that would be great. All right, again, thank you, Duane. My name is David Wright, and I am the chair for the Marketing Awards for this year. Um, just wanted to let you all know a little bit about the Marketing Awards before we go a little bit further. Um, this was something that was instituted in 2016, and it serves as an annual opportunity to recognize well-designed and innovative media for residents' life and housing operations. Um, the awards acknowledge Kuwait members and their departments for their accomplishments and creativity. So we're looking to have as many submissions as possible. Um, we're looking to gather judges. So I'll be reaching out to a lot of judges that we had in the past to see if they would like to re-up for this year as well. But if any of you all um, listening today um, would like to become a judge for this particular year, you can definitely reach out to um, Dwayne and Dwayne can pass that along and then we can have a huge number of judges. We're looking to have a lot of judges this year so that we don't have um, too many submissions to review per person. So the more judges we have, the less amount of submissions that each judge will have to um, comb through and look over. But yeah, we're looking to have all of that going. Um, for the submissions, we're looking to, uh, there we go. Thank you, Dwayne. So the categories that we have this summer, I mean, this year, are overall campaign, brochure, booklet, handout, poster, large format, printed piece, specialty item, promotional item, website, social media, interactive marketing, email marketing, logo mark icon, videos, specialty other, and crisis communication. Um, our timeline, we're looking to open the entry form on 
the 15th, so the end of this week. And it's only going to be open technically for like a month for this time. So it's going to close on August the 12th. So we're looking to notify any of the winners that we're going to have in the September time frame, And then all of our conference, at our conference, we're going to announce all of the winners as well for our first, second, and third place. And then our overall campaign. So I'm going to pass it back over to Dwayne. Caitlin, if you want to take it away, all of you. Yes. So thank you all for letting us speak a little bit about the conference and what to expect with the Marketing Awards. Um, so today we're focused on an interactive roundtable um, focused in communication and marketing in an environment that's constantly changing and evolving. While we do have panelists and some preset questions that we're gonna go through and talk about, if you have questions or if you have ideas or things that you've seen, please don't hesitate to involve in the conversation. We'll do some things to the panelists. We'll open it up to the floor. We really want this to be kind of an organic conversation. We have some amazing experts here that range a wide variety um, who we have seen at different conferences and are doing some really exciting things on their campus. So I really hope you all are excited for what we're going through. Before we get started, I just wanted to note some things about this session. Dwayne, if you could go to the next slide for me, thank you. Um, so the session is being recorded. We will send out an email to all of the participants today um, that highlights, um, that has the YouTube video <laughs> uh, that will have this recorded session. So if you have some team members who couldn't make it, they'll be able to watch it later. Um, please feel free to use the chat to introduce yourself with your name, position, institution, and pronouns if you would like to. Um, again, this is conversation based, so we want you to be just as much of a participant as our panelists are. Um, if you would like to have your webcam on, we do welcome it. If you'd like to keep it off until we turn it over from the panelists, you're more than welcome to do that. Um, and feel free, if you have questions, you can add them in the chat, and I would be more than happy to either moderate them for you, or when it's time to turn it over for the audience questions, you can unmute and ask them yourself. Um, and then please feel free to continue to, the conversation within the chat, add your email, um, and we'll also be taking down some notes to share out kind of a recap of what we talked about today. Um, so with that, we are so excited to kind of get started here. Um, so we can go ahead and end the slide share doing at this point. Thank you. Uh, some tech issues. So right, team members coming through to help us out here. Um, so my name is Caitlin, and I am the virtual chair committee. Um, and so I've been putting on all of these with my wonderful team, hoping to get a wide variety of topics. And I'm very excited about our panelists here. Um, so in a predetermined order, we're going by institution. Uh, so Richard, can you please introduce yourself, your position, uh, pronouns if you would like, and then a little bit of how you work with marketing and communications. Sure. So my name is Richard Ronquillo. I'm the Director of Marketing Communications for Student Housing and Dining Services at University of California, Davis. Uh, I use he, him pronouns. Uh, I've been on campus since 1999. So uh, hopefully I don't look it, but I've been around a little bit. Um, I do, I'm in charge of all the marketing communication for all of our student housing and our dining facilities. We house around 11,000 students, both in residence halls, uh, grad housing, and in, uh, in family housing. Uh, we have, uh, we have uh, I do all the marketing for the dining commons. We also operate all the retail restaurants. We have uh, markets. And uh, th new this year, I get to do marketing for a bar called uh, Gun Rock. So I'm pretty excited about that as well. Um, so we are, so I kind of every day, we're kind of coming up with new ways to communicate. I'm in charge of all the social and web presence for the department. Uh, and we work in partnership with our campus colleagues. Thank you, we're so excited to have you. Megan, would you like to go next? Yeah, hey everyone, my name is Megan Jagnow. I use she, her pronouns, and I serve as the Director for Student Life Communications at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. Um, I actually, I worked in housing for around nine years um, prior to moving into this role in more of a centralized student life position. And so um, University Housing is now one of the offices, um, one of about 20 offices that we support um, in our centralized office. Now we have about 8,000 students um, on campus. And um, I am excited to talk about, you know, the things that we have implemented both in university housing as well as um, across student life when we're talking about engagement and retention, which is obviously something that is so critical to our university housing counterparts and what they try to do with their student engagement every day. So excited to be here. Thank you for joining us, Carissa. Hi, everyone. My name is Carissa Violanti. I use she, her pronouns. I am the Associate Director of Digital Marketing at the Yale Alumni Association. 
So in my capacity there, I am part of a three-person team where my primary goal and responsibility is to oversee our digital marketing. So our social media, our email communications, any kind of online outreach that we're doing. Um, our main focus is to really engage alumni wherever they are. Um, my, my formal background is in graphic design and information design. So I really love to implement uh, high quality visual styles with the work that we're doing. Um, it's, it's really great. I've been at Yale for about 10 years and I've been with the YA for three years. So that's me. Hi everybody. I'll just go right into it, Caitlin. Don't worry, I got you. Um, I'm Stephanie Stevens. I, I use she, her pronouns as well. And I am an associate director of regional clubs at the Yale Alumni Association. And obviously that sounds very outside of what you all do. However, Carissa and I partner very closely on a lot of social media initiatives, especially in the past three years as part of our wonderful experience of staying at home and reaching folks in a very different way. I host a live social media show called Yale Alumni Live, which we're really happy to share a little bit about later. And just for context, the Yale Alumni Association supports both Yale College, which is our traditional undergraduate program, and then 14 graduate and professional schools. So with all of those alumni, we, we are looking at about 175,000 living alumni. So that is kind of our population that we are working with regularly. And uh, just as a side, uh, our professional organization is CASE, and I have served as a CASE volunteer for conferences and the board for several years. So I would just like to thank the team here who have brought us in and totally understand your challenges. And I'm going to give a pitch to be an awards judge because that is the best way that I have gleaned best practices across the country as a case awards judge. So do the same thing, guys. And thank you so much for having us. Well, we're really excited to have you all here um, and hopefully um, you all can help shed some wisdom and gain some wisdom as we go through this. So I want to start off with um, kind of a different question to get us going, but what are some common misconceptions people have related to marketing communications and how can we help combat those misconceptions that folks have effectively? Well, I can get started. Um, I think for, for me, one of the main misconceptions I deal with is at a place like Yale that, um, you know, we're dealing with so much tradition and uh, such an established brand that um, when people come to me with original ideas that I'm going to say no. <laughs> and um, one of the ways that I've combated that is specifically working directly with Steph. I mean, that social media show she mentioned, that was a crazy outlandish idea. And instead of saying, no, I said, yeah, let's do it. Let's find a way to make that work. Um, and so to combat kind of things like that, it's just about having freedom to play and giving yourself a little bit of breathing room to explore new ideas. Uh, Steph, do you wanna add anything? No, I think, you know, obviously we can get into the like meat and potatoes of that a little bit more, but it is very scary, I think, um, you know, to put yourselves, your institution out there in a world that we've been taught is like, it's permanent, it's forever, it's never going away, you can't make a mistake. But I do think that we've shifted into a time where people do kind of throw a little more spaghetti at the wall and the audience is a lot more forgiving and understanding and kind of enjoys the fact that you're trying new things. So definitely um, being bold and adventurous is something new, I think, for this this world. For me, the biggest misconception is that anything on social is great. So just really talking about what does it mean to have a visual story and what does it mean to put that out there? Uh, I mean, I, I still cringe when someone takes a PDF that we emailed people and say, okay, put this on social media and that PDF has a QR code. So put that in Instagram with a QR code. And I'm like, wait, wait, wait. So I, I agree. I, I think it's, fun. it's a great time to be experimental and it's a great time to do that, but there also are some rules in regards to, you know, you want to make content that not only educates, but because we want people to, to drive people to our social media platforms, we also want to make sure we create content that is engaging. 
And so it's a balancing act of creating content that lets people know things, but also is creating content that students want to come and see and want to engage with. And, and I think that that's always a big misconception is that people just don't understand the amount of effort it goes to create that, to find that balance and to create that content and, and not everything creates engagement. And that's, a, that's hard for some people to grasp. Yeah, I agree. I think that there's a degree where our students are looking to be able to have a higher degree of authenticity and the presence of our offices. They don't like stuff to be quite so curated. Um, it's really hard to be able to toe the line between brands and between being real and meeting them where they're at. And so I agree, like there's a, a point where we need to experiment and we need to be more flexible, but then also making sure that we're, they, I mean, this is an audience that has had really sophisticated campaigns thrown at them their entire lives through different digital mediums. And so we ha they have a very, very high, um, I think, expectations from us. And so making sure, um, Richard, your point is very well taken that, you know, we're looking at um, executing things intentionally and making sure that it's speaking to them and meeting them where they're at and that we're utilizing their time wisely, because otherwise you're just going to get unfollowed or you're not going to be seen as a reliable source. And that's going to damage um, your ability to influence um, and to um, support. I think another um, misconception that I hear often, and I work really hard to um, empower people as much as I can, is I hear, especially when I'm working with new staff, that, well, my program is too small, or, I, you know, like, my thing doesn't matter, like, how could that possibly, like, reach up to the point of, like, marketing and communications, and I think that that is one of those things where I work hard to help that person or that program understand the impact that they're having on students in my scope. So we, like I said, I'm in all of student life now or serve all student life offices now at my institution. And some of the most impactful and wonderful content that is that resonates with students and that people celebrate and rally around comes out of a office that has one person. And that is, that's it, it's our pride center and it's teeny tiny and their programs that they're doing are incredible. And the stories that are coming out of that office are so moving and they're making a difference on our campus. And that's the part where it just make, I'm like, oh man, like if, if the little office of one can do it with the programs that they have, like imagine when you have the, you know, the housing and the, the staff that are going into the programming and the outreach and everything that's happening every day with those students. It's a tremendous story that is there and that needs to be celebrated. Um, and being able to get beyond the operational side of things, how to engage, you know, how to fill out the conch or whatever it might be and really celebrating the moments that are happening in the halls and those connections those students are making. Like that, that's an opportunity that I think is oftentimes untapped. Thank you. So you all touched on social media a little bit. Um, so how has social media on your campuses or in your roles shifted or evolved um, over the past few years? And how do you foresee it continuing to shift as you move forward? I mean, I'll, I'll be honest, COVID changed the landscape with visual and with communication. So COVID moved communication from in person to let's create videos, let's create social, let's create, let's Let's explore new ways of communicating with students that physically can't come to campus. And what we found is students responded really well to that. So we don't want to eliminate that. So now what's happening is we're adding to our workload. So everything that we did special for COVID is now the expectation, plus all the stuff we did pre-COVID, they want that too. So it's kind of made it a little, it's made it a more central piece of it, which has put a lot more emphasis, especially in our unit, you know, on our photography, on our videography. Oh. That was one thing I heard the videographer in the back of my head kind of telling me 30 minute videos or five, two minute videos do not take two minutes to shoot. I got to put that out there as a common misconception that yeah, two minute videos do not take two minutes to shoot. Just want to put that out there. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I, I think it's become more, uh, it's become more important. Uh, it's become a, a way to communicate with students in a way that kind of resonates with them. But as Megan said, authenticity is the big part of it. Like you can't, you have to create us, you know, we need to create an account that is engaging and authentic and doesn't just feel like a giant sales job.
I think too, you know, at least on at the University of Tennessee, I've seen social media become its own thing and it's become so much stronger and it's become more, I don't know, like legitimate or serious. I'm seeing strategies being developed specifically for social as opposed to it being like the frosting on top of the cake where we're like, well, we'll just shove it on social too. It's like the junk drawer of like all the other things that we're doing. Like why not put it on social? It's free, right? And I had a conversation with a colleague earlier today that just because something is free doesn't mean you're not paying for it. So there's a degree where like, you know, if you have, you know, content that is not resonating with, with your audience or you have, you know, um, Richard, you mentioned like just throwing up a PDF flyer or something like that has a cost associated with it. Like if your student is going to not follow you or not engage with you because you're not putting up good content, you have a strategy for your presence, you're going to lose something out of that. And so I've really seen that become more serious over the 10 years I've been here on this campus. And you're right, that COVID completely changed that landscape. And I think for both for better and for worse, the, the expectations are higher. Um, and we are putting more weight on the impact that social can have, which is great. And we also need to have the resources to be able to do it well and to do it right. And that's probably one of the, I was gonna go into that a little bit later with some of the questions, but we really have to be resourcing our areas that are communicating with students and making sure that they have what they need. If you are expecting to have a one person be a, a writer, an editor, a videographer, photographer, a social media maven, like whatever it is, like it's gonna be really hard to do all of those things super well. And if a person can do all those things really well, you might not be able to afford them, like to be able to hire them, like that's the reality. So being able to make sure that as like, you know, advocating with your leadership, if you want to be able to have these certain things done um, and done well and achieve these goals, these are the resources that we need to be dedicating for them to happen. So for us, we're kind of like in a, in a different kind of bucket. So, you know, our main audience is uh, folks who've already left campus. And, um, you know, so it's a very different way that we're kind of communicating with folks. Um, and then as you mentioned COVID, um, you know, also what was really interesting about that is I started maybe only five or six months before um, COVID really kind of started to affect our, our staff and our communications plans. Um, and prior to me joining the YAA, we had virtually no social media presence or strategy. So not only were we evolving a strategy uh, from the ground up for the first time ever, but we were doing it in the middle of a pandemic. And we were doing it, um, to your point about having enough resources, really under-resourced and the fact that there were at the time just two staff members trying to make everything work and function and, and go together. So um, for us, the evolution has really been around uh, growth and strategy and really making sure that we're doing everything from a very intentional place. Um, you know, to your point about everything having a cost, uh, really thinking about are the posts we make engaging? Are they adding something to the lives of our alumni? Uh, are they cutting through the noise? Um, are we reinforcing that connection back to the Yale tradition and, and the experience that they had when they were here, making them feel like they never left campus? And how do we do that in the middle of a pandemic when they have so many other things on their plate? Um, you know, for us, we, we basically went from almost no following on three channels to now having about 20,000 followers spread across six channels. And on average, every year we get about 2 million impressions. So I think we're growing. We're really excited with, with how far we've come. Um, in large part, that has a lot to do with the YA staff and empowering YA staff to be involved a little bit in our social strategy. Um, and that ties into how closely I work with Steph. I mean, really Steph and I, we talk every day. Um, you know, there are, we're always thinking about ways that, that we can um, support each other in the work that we're doing. Um, you know, we've mentioned a couple of exact examples, but I don't know, Steph, do you wanna add anything to that? Well, I think it's important to note too that um... 
while we are different in that we're dealing with a population of alumni, we do also engage with students through our channels because there is such a strong desire for students to network with alumni. So it's not um, completely separate. I think there's probably some things that you all can glean from the work that we do um, and even tap into your own alumni networks because I think that that is hugely important for students to see that continuity and um, you know that whole piece. <laughs> Engagement before graduation is not such a bad thing. Um, but Chris is selling herself short a little bit because she's also engaged on a lot of different um, platforms that were just not even on our radar, like TikTok ambassadors that we now have and utilizing Instagram. Instagram has really truly become just another like prong in the fork of engagement for us. We use it for absolutely everything. And I think Richard um, alluded to the fact that now it's the expectation. Like we have such an incredible amount of work on our plate in alumni engagement. The biggest question is, consistently, how are we going to now reach people whose expectation is that we are going to do things for them virtually and in person. And so we've been really heavily leaning on the live features of Facebook and Instagram to deliver what we think are truly hybrid experiences. Um, something that we started doing kind of accidentally was essentially sideline reporting. So we are going to events and activities on our campus and going live so that people can feel like they're there with us. And I think that works obviously for alumni, but can work for students too, especially if you have a remote population. So um, that's been a really interesting development over the last year or two, I would say. And obviously my name lends itself to it, like Stephanie Stevens reporting live, right? I mean, none of you have your camera on, but I hope that made you laugh. <laughs> that's great. Uh, so you've all briefly touched on this a little bit. So what is the biggest challenge or one of the biggest challenges that you see with marketing and communication? Uh, Megan, you kind of started to touch on it, so I don't know if you wanted to start us off with this one. Yeah, so I think that one of the things, I look at it almost as like this two-pronged approach, like budget and bandwidth. To me, I think especially post-COVID is something that is a constant point of advocacy, I am sure, for every person in this room, where we're thinking about, you know, what are the goals? How are we going to get there? Do we have the bandwidth to make it? Are we spending our time working on the things that are going to move the needle? Or do we need to be sun reevaluating, sunsetting, you know, focusing on something different? And then having the resources dedicated to that. Um, I think I see both you know, here within the higher ed space, but really I would argue in for profit spaces as well, you have these employers that are trying to hire a magician that can be an expert of everything and then pay them minimal. And it just, you, you, you can't, it, you, you really need to start dedicating the resources and the um, support, however that looks for your campus or looks for your department, identify how you can really wrap your arms around the marketing and communications professionals in your space because they're the ones that are, can make or break your brand. They're the ones that can absolutely tank your, you know, your office if you're having to deal with something serious and having, you know, when you're talking about brand promise, they're the ones that are making sure that that brand promise exists and that people know about it. And so I just, I think that that's a big challenge, but it's a place of advocacy and where we're all at and being able to back up that advocacy with numbers as much as you can, being able to look at that data, benchmark against other institutions and figure out where you can make the most difference with your students. Like that's really gonna be something that is so important to, um, to really focus on. And so that's just from my perspective, what I see, I'm assuming there's like a lot of others, but every time when I'm engaging in conversations, it just somehow, somehow comes back down to bandwidth and budget. So that was my answer for that one. And I guess I'll just piggyback on that. I think the biggest challenge, it's, it's, it's overwhelming process to when you start to build a marketing unit in, in a department. So I, I also, my background is in higher education. Um, you know, I got my a master's degree from Michigan State University. And, and so when I started doing marketing at UC Davis, it was me and one other person, you know, and so uh, just, and I think I was in a fortunate location because for our student housing and dining services, for both our dining and, and housing, we're all auxiliaries. So, 
you know, and a lot of our apartment complexes, we private, we partner with private partners, there's kickers if we fall below, uh, pretty much there's a, there's a fee associated if we fall below a certain occupancy rate. So it's important for us to keep our occupancy. I think we have to stay above 96% occupancy or we have to pay a little bit to the vendors. So with that, there was a lot of me doing the numbers, doing the legwork, showing how the little bit we're doing is making a difference and how when we add a person, this is how much, you know, one person doesn't equal just like one worth, you know, one little thing of growth. Like, you know, when I first hired the social media person, it made a huge difference in our, in our process. When I hired a person that could do video and photography, it made a huge difference in our take rate, our engagement rate, what we're seeing. And so um, it's a lot of, there's a lot of work trying to justify what we do and to make sure people understand it, especially to, to some of the, super, some of, some of, in my particular position, some of my supervisors may not have been as familiar with social or familiar with marketing. They, they were used to a, a time when you just said the word UC Davis and people would come, not realizing that it's, it's a competitive and how it's a different market than it used to be. And so, um, so that was a lot of my time was spending about that bandwidth, about that budget, as it was said, uh, trying to figure out how to grow a team and being very intentional to, to not grow too much, to try to figure out like what's the right balance between how much money we're putting in for staffing and what we're getting out for for staff and that's it's been a process i have a, a more substantial team now uh, because of a lot of little baby steps to get there but i think as people are building their own marketing team, i think that can be overwhelming and it can, it can get a little bit discouraging at points uh, as people don't quite understand what you're doing So I think for, for us, one of our biggest challenges, um, I'm going to turn it around. I'm also going to say it's an opportunity. Um, it's using our platforms wisely and ethically to create inclusive spaces, um, to think about ways that we can tell stories that haven't been told before, um, and to think about um, what Yale is today and how we can begin to introduce that to people who maybe have been out of touch with all of the change and progress and growth that's been going on on campus. Um, I think also it's about cutting through the noise. There's just so much that um, is constantly being thrown at everybody, whether it's on social specifically or in your email inbox or text messages that you're getting from family and friends, there's just so much. Um, so I, I really, when I'm kind of designing our content, I'm thinking a lot about uh, how I'm using the platforms for good, how I'm advancing the mission, not only of Yale, but specifically the YA's mission um, and how I can fold all of that wonderful progress and change and also important conversations that need to happen, right? Like things that need to be discussed that maybe, you know, maybe still need work. Maybe we still need to do better. Um, but bringing that to the surface and creating an inclusive space that's safe to have those conversations. Thank you all for sharing. Um, apologies if you all hear the cat in the background. She's really engaged in this conversation as well. Um, but so, okay, so we've talked about some of the challenges. What's something that's been really innovative in terms of marketing information, whether it's on a whole, whether it's social media based, whether it's something you've done or something you've seen done um, that you really, that kind of gets you excited and gets you going and gets you moving? Um, well, I think one of our most innovative approaches has definitely been Yale Alumni Live. Um, I have to put a, a big kind of shout out there to Steph. Um, before I let her dig into the details of that, um, just some of the ways that we've been able to like branch that out and make that a bigger deal. Uh, we've, we've definitely thought about uh, other things that we can be doing on social, like creating Facebook frames when there's a time when those were easy to create. Um, and Instagram stickers, Instagram effects and filters, uh, learning how to, how to code those things and or finding vendors who can work on those projects for us. Um, the sideline reporting has been huge, as Steph mentioned, but, but also just thinking about how we can take folks who are at home and bring them along for the ride, really make it like an immersive experience for them. 
specifically um, the way that we just handled our most recent three weekend run of reunions. Um, you know, as, as Steph mentioned earlier, <laughs> yes, and David was, was critical in that as well. Um, as Steph mentioned earlier, our alumni audience is divided between uh, our undergrads and also our graduate and professional schools. And of those undergrads, there's only a small percentage that are actively in a reunion cycle. So the challenge there is how do we make reunions exciting for the other 80% of our audience, right? And so really kind of thinking about ways that we could bring Yale Alumni Live to tell a story that we could say, hey, can't you, can you wait for your reunion that's gonna happen next year or two years or three years from now? Or just inviting folks who might not have a traditional reunion experience as part of the GMP schools um, to come back to campus and experience some things that are there year round like um, campus tours and our libraries that are open year round. So really kind of thinking about that holistic approach to our entire audience. Um, but definitely hands down Yale Alumni Live is the coolest thing that we've done. <laughs> I feel like uh, it's old news at this point, but I will just give a little bit of detail about Yale Alumni Live because it is something we're very proud of because it has served very much as a launch pad. And it's hard to know if this is, um, I think it is applicable to any audience, um, but it's hard because I don't know all of you and we don't know your institutions and who your specific audience is. But what we tried to do uh, in the very early days of staying at home was to replicate something that we saw as a new trend um, on social media. And the fact that usage was like incredibly high. Um, what were we all doing? But scrolling Facebook and TikTok and um, Instagram is, and put like a reaction if you know who D Nice is. Um, D Nice started doing club quarantine on Instagram, basically like cool sets of music. Um, we stole this idea from him. And what we started doing with Yo Alumni Live was having conversations with alumni who had cool stories to share. We did it on um, Instagram Live. We did it on Facebook Live. Eventually, we did it on StreamYard. So it's a podcast, but it's a podcast with video. And I think the best part about that is that you get to see reactions of the people that you're talking to and sharing those stories and their memories of campus or whatever it is that they're doing for work. But it has now transitioned into this opportunity where we go live at events and we, um, we did a lot of what everybody else was doing on Yale and Live, you know, wine tastings live, cl uh, cocktail classes live. We did some tours of some facilities, those of you who are responsible for, for buildings, you know, tours of those facilities um, behind the scenes with commentary is kind of cool if you have people who aren't there. Um, but what I thought was really fun about reunions that Carissa just mentioned is we really spent a lot of time sourcing our content from cool trends that were happening, um, whether it was TikTok or Instagram. Everybody knows that dogs are always like a pretty cool thing to um, get, garner a lot of views. And we just happen to be lucky to have our mascot is Handsome Dan, the first living mascot in the country. Um, and we are currently on Handsome Dan the 19th. Uh, so <laughs> quite a bit of uh, history there. And the Handsome Dan the 19th was introduced to our community back in March of 2021. So we scooped uh, the whole university on introducing Handsome Dan on Instagram live and of course got like you know thousands of views on that live um but another tiktok trend that we started to do was at our reunions we saw um you know the videos that people do like finish this line so we went up to reunion guests and said okay this was a popular song there that you graduated finished the lines of the song and it was really fun and people got really engaged and we garnered some new views from that but it was like just a really cool opportunity to try trends and make them work. And I laugh at this all the time because I was at a different institution when the Harlem Shake was a big thing. And we tried to pull off the Harlem Shake in like 2013 and it was absolutely pathetic. The worst thing you ever saw. But that was then, and this is now, and you can hop on those trends and make them applicable for what you're doing without it being inauthentic, 
but having it be intentional and, and kind of bringing people together to get, grab their attention. So it's just been really fun to experiment and play. And please like check us out on at Yellow Alumni on Instagram if you want to know if we're legit or not. Um, <laughs> and we'd love to answer any questions you have about some of the fun things we're doing because we know it's not apples to apples with what you all are doing. So we would love a challenge. Tell us who your audience is and we can help maybe share some of the things that we've done, how it might pivot to work for you. Do you want me to answer this question right now uh, about student engagement on Young Alumni Live? Okay, so student engagement. We have one of the most fun parts of Yellow Alumni Live has been having students on the show um, because all students are future alumni, hopefully, if they matriculate, right? So retention, all that. Um, one of the most fun parts of having the students on the show is really giving the alumni an opportunity to see what the students are who they are today. Um, they may not look the same as they as our alumni remember, but they have, you know, all that common thread that weaves throughout. So we highlighted a number of students as part of our pep rally promotion, which if any of you are football fans, you know, Yale Harvard has a really big rivalry in the 2020, we didn't play. So that was a huge touch point that we missed. So we interviewed current students who were cheerleaders, who were football players, who were pep band members. Um, We've had other students who um, we had the first, the Yale College Council had its first black president two years ago. Um, and so we had him on to talk about his experiences. We've had a lot of different students come on Yale Alumni Live and a lot of students have seen Carissa and I around campus and said, oh, didn't, didn't somebody like, didn't you do something on Instagram? I saw you, you look familiar. So that's pretty cool. Um, and Carissa also has, um, TikTok ambassadors that are students, current students. So they help us uh, build in that angle of engagement. And then, you know, when it comes building phase, I mean, I think we're always evolving. We've probably done like 125 episodes at this point, um, but they're constantly evolving and changing and meeting the needs of where we're at now because things are so different than they were two years ago obviously but we don't want to let it go entirely so it's it's a constant pivot uh Krista, i don't know if you want to add to anything else but we definitely have seen some really great engagement with students and we interviewed them like live at events as well um which was really fun so Krista, go ahead yeah i think um one of the other things that we've seen is when we have uh, Yale Alumni Live episodes that have students on screen as our guests, um, we tend to also see that those students are really keen to send out invitations and let their friends know that they're going to be uh, on live. And so we'll see those students start to follow us. And to Stephanie's point earlier, uh, current students become future alumni. So it's been really great in growing our following uh, in addition to just the direct engagement of having them be guests online. Um, but other than that, yeah, Steph covered it pretty well. Megan, Richard, anything that you want to share that you've been innovative with or you're proud of? You know, I think we're very fortunate where we are at UC Davis. Uh, I'm able to tell the story of food, which is kind of an interesting and kind of engaging thing to do. So, you know, we, we're starting this series now where we are interviewing farmers. So we get our food either from on campus or within a couple of miles from campus. And because we're in ag school, a lot of our alumni actually are growing the food that we're purchasing for our dining services program. So to be able to tell the student that, okay, you're eating these tomatoes, these tomatoes were, were planted by students for years, you know, planted by students, being picked by, harvested by students. They're, they're brought here, they're flash frozen, we're serving them, we're doing all this other stuff. So they really could tell them the entire, we even had, a, we even made a cartoon about Thomas the tomato and his, actually Tomas, Tomas the tomato and his story from the field all the way to your plate, which was kind of twisted if you really think about it, but it was a really good story and students seemed to like it. Um, but uh, really, uh, really tried to engage, it, we're really fortunate about that. And then something that we're really proud that's coming soon is that we will be working on um, I'll be able, I'm, I'm branding and working on a new food truck that will, is being worked for in conjunction with what we call Aggie Compass, which is our food security initiative. And so it's going to be a pay what you can food truck. 
So we are going to create a food truck that will be on campus where students will have the opportunity to pay whatever they can uh, in order to get meals. So this truck will be available. Um, and so I'm really, it's a really inciting story of food. And it's another way that we can show that dining service is committed to the entire community. Uh, and it's a way for us to kind of use some of our excess food in a new innovative way to get to students that in, in need. So it's kind of a cool program. So I'm really enjoying right now telling a lot of different stories about food. I got to do a lot of taste testing too, which is kind of nice, though I'm vegan, so that makes it kind of interesting, so. <laughs> Megan, anything you'd like to share? Gosh, these are such great ideas. I don't have anything that remotely compares. Um, I, I think our office is pretty new. We've only been around for about three years. And so a lot of our innovation has actually been more in process and workflow and making sure that we can make things as efficient as possible to expand our bandwidth to be able to work on something else. And so that's really where our like commitment has been. Um, and so when it comes to social media specifically, we've tried to figure out a workflow where it allows our students to be present on our social media channels, that they're the ones that are developing the content content that they're putting together the strategy, but that they are still routing that through staff since their, their content is representing the Division of Student Life as a whole. So really like firming that up and what that looks like to where we're able to capture student voice, but it's still vetted in a way to where there's a cohesive strategy around it. So it's not nearly as um, as flashy as some of the other examples that have been given, which are super awesome. And I'm really excited. I'm particularly interested in the um, Yale Alumni Live. We've been toying around with the idea of doing a podcast. Um, and I really love the crossover between the podcast and the social media to be able to address both your um, populations that are on campus, maybe non-traditional students, families, alumni, et cetera, um, but to also cross it over into social media to still capture that student um, audience as well, knowing that students might not be as active in a podcast on its own, but would definitely be more exposed to it if it was in a space such as social media to introduce them to it. So I love that idea. Um, but it's that's really where we've been spending a lot of our time and trying to figure out like if we don't have the budget to do something how do we make something more efficient if we have a little bit of a budget but can't hire somebody how do we contract that out with a third-party contractor what is you know going to give us more bang for our buck you know if it's spending eight hours editing a video when i could pay a contractor you know, uh, some money, but less money than it would be to hire somebody to do it, uh, or sorry, to hire someone in office to do it. If I can contract that out, that's a savings. I can then make something more efficient. So that's really where our efforts have been over the past couple of years. I want to just say, Richard, I'm obsessed with everything you just told us. I am like, Krista, can we get a food truck? Krista, like, how do we follow the farm? Um, and I, it reminded me of an episode that we did of Yale Alumni Live that was really awesome that might work for you as well. Um, we have a, a, a club on campus called Maury's, which has been in a few movies. So you might be familiar with the idea of like drinking a cup um, of juice, of course. Um, but we had the, we, it was closed. Morris was closed during COVID and it's a very, um, very popular place for celebrations at Yale. And so we asked the chef if he would go into the kitchen while the restaurant was closed and teach everyone how to make one of the famous like Morris dishes. Um, so that was really, really well received. I had people contacting me for that recipe for weeks after, um, because food is absolutely one of the things that tie people together. And we have been working with our dining services folks, as a matter of fact, to try and schedule with them some inside behind the scenes looks at some of the food celebrations that we have on campus. Um, so I love that. And um, throw your alumni association a bone and let them get behind the scenes of some of this stuff. Okay. <laughs> oh no, we, I try love to, it. we try to connect with alumni because we're doing, and we're doing a lot of it. We, it's funny you say that we did a, we did a, what we called the chef challenge. When, yep. we were, when we were locked down where the chefs were cooking food. Yeah. So, uh, but it was a Zoom live event where the students yeah. would vote on the proteins. So yeah. they would start the cooking and they would vote on the protein and then they would vote and then they would, they would vote on challenges. So sometimes they would get a mystery ingredient and sometimes they would have to use special utensils. And that was some of our most engaging content. And uh, yeah. my staff member who does that is like, he loves the fact he walks around campus and they're like, oh, you're Alex Fisher-Wagner. I know who you are. I know who you are. So, I love uh, that. I think that 
that's great. And I want to, you, you also just reminded me of something saying that you did that on Zoom. We did start early on with a Zoom to Facebook tether um, because we wanted people to be able to log in if they wanted to. But the reason why we use Instagram and Facebook live is because there is no login required. So a lot of times we're just meeting people where they were that had access to other things. We use StreamYard um, also, which will allow you to connect to LinkedIn, YouTube, and Facebook. So if anybody has any questions about those tools, I'd be more than happy to share, but that is awesome. And I love it. Thank you, Richard, for now giving me new ideas. <laughs> We can talk all offline because we have a campus brewery and a campus uh, viticulture program too. So I can tell you some stuff we've done with that in our bar. I'm going to yeah. do you one better and come visit you because California is my territory. So we'll be connecting yes, yes, online, <laughs> offline after this. Definitely be a guest. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Well, thank you so much panelists for joining us today. I really appreciate all of your insights. Um, from our audience, do we have any questions or anything that you're doing that you want to share with the group? Um, we have some a little bit of time left and I want to make sure because um, I know all of you are doing amazing work on your campuses um, and making processes efficient speaks to my heart as an operations person so you know might not be as flashy and fun as social media campaigns but definitely fun for, for those of us that are more of those operations folks. All right, if someone wants to share, that's totally fine. Um, so what we'll do is we will um, send out a wrap-up email to everyone who attended today. Um, that kind of has the recording once we get that um, putting up. And then we will also, um, I will include the contact information of our lovely panelists. So if you heard something that you're interested in or you want to continue the conversation, I know they'd be more than happy to share um, and have other folks to talk and bounce ideas off of. Um, is not it's a small world and we like to bounce ideas um it does look like some folks said um here in the chat it, that we're looking to dip our toe in the water of TikTok. does anyone have any tips or tricks to get started we have a TikTok account are we i'm not sure if we're the only ones but um uh, our TikTok account is is a baby. It's still growing. It's brand new. Um, but our our main thing was getting students or alumni ambassadors. That's really we empowered people to tell their stories directly, um, and that way t it required the least amount of staff oversight. Um, we do vet everything before we post it. Uh, but the students are really kind of on top of what those trends are. Uh, interestingly, though, some of our best performing videos are the three minute mark videos of older alumni sharing wisdom. So uh, you might find that some longer stories are actually just as engaging as short, quick trends. So that's what's worked for us, but we're still growing. Carissa, you have a really great... Um like one sheeter for TikTok ambassadors, Didn't, don't you? Do you had some, we worked really hard on some of those materials. I do, I do. Okay. And they're, they're online. I'll see if I can find it before we wrap and I'll drop the link in the chat. Our model with TikTok is kind of unusual. The campus has one TikTok account and we all can create content and submit it to campus to create the, the TikTok, uh, create to, uh, we create the content and submit, and then they, they work on a rotation and play depending on the time of year. Um, I, I would I tell this to everybody when they're trying to come up with their social media ideas is don't be afraid to borrow and look at other stuff that's trending and doing well. I mean, you got to look around and see what's 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 working. You know, sometimes you might be a little late to some of the trends, but that's okay. I, I think that, that it gives you a good idea where to start as you're trying to build, you kind of creating your content. I did see, um, so I was just over in the UK um, on vacation, um, and one of the trends actually that I saw a lot of their universities using was throwback trends, um, and so a lot of their social media um, and media that they just had out
out in the city, like to promote college and university, was throwback to things that had been done in like the 80s, early 90s. Um, and it was really interesting. Every person you walked by was like, oh, hey, mom, what was that? Like, you know, all the youngins who didn't know. Um, and the parents were like, oh, this is what it was. And the students were like, we gotta go, we gotta go see this. Um, and so it was pretty interesting as just a visitor. Um, I was like, I have no idea what this means. I didn't realize this was a throwback. But like how sometimes that throwback even brings brings forth and can get some of that energy and that excitement around it. It looks like some folks are dropping some amazing links here into um, the chat. Um, Krista, are you okay if I pull this link out and share it when I send the recap to everyone? Yes, totally. And I can see if I can find that one sheeter uh, PDF and I'll send that to you. I'm just real quickly, I want to just add, um, I just want to put this out there. Just, uh, I don't think the, I don't think design people get enough love from us, but just remembering, you know, there's a lot of things, especially when you want to create inclusive content about the colors you pick, the visual, the layouts, all that stuff is really important. I was even looking at the slideshow that we had up a little bit and probably some different color choices I would have made, but that's okay. Um, but yeah, especially when you're trying to be inclusive, like, I mean, people just think visual, you know, like when you think ADA compliance, you think just visual compliance, but there's also colorblind. There's a lot of other things that you have to consider and colors that go together. So just, just know that when you that one of the things that's a challenge is to make sure that you're creating inclusive content and, and that you're always having closed captioning on your videos that you're always looking at your PDFs, to make sure they're built correctly. So they'll be out accessible by screen readers. So there's a lot, I mean, that's probably its own session on how to make marketing uh, accessible, but I think it's one of those things that's getting a lot more attention and because social is becoming a heavier part of our communication strategy. So I think it's something that I just want to put the call, just put the love out there because there's a lot of people that spend a lot of time debating and working on those particular issues because it, it's complicated and it's constantly evolving. Richard, that would be a great roundtable conversation for the conference, I'm just saying. Shamelessly plug programs. There you go. <laughs> um, oh yeah, Dwayne said the same thing in the chat. Look at us. We're all on the same page here. Um, well, thank you again so much, panelists, for being here. Thank you, attendees, for coming. Hopefully you enjoyed and you learned something new. Um, again, I'll send out a recap um, at the end of the week that has a link to this video, as well as some of the links that have been shared here as well. Um, but thank you all so much. Enjoy the rest of your Tuesday, um, and we will hopefully see you at the conference in September.